Hello and welcome to the Mercury Project, Mercury Atlas 9. This is the final mission of the Mercury program and also the final video. Mercury Atlas 9 was the final manned space mission of the US Mercury program. Launched on May 15, 1963 from the launch complex 14 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. The spacecraft, named Faith-1, completed 22 Earth orbits before splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. Piloted by Gordon Cooper, then an Air Force Major, the Atlas rocket was number 130D, and the Mercury spacecraft was number 20. This marks the last time an American was launched alone to conduct an entirely solo orbital mission. The flight of Sigma-7 had been so nearly perfect that some at NASA thought America should quit while it was ahead and make Mercury Atlas 8 the last Mercury mission, and not to risk the chance of future disaster. NASA pushed the first generation Mercury hardware far enough, and taking more chances on another longer mission was not warranted. Instead, they should move on to the Gemini program. Manned Space Center officers, however, believed that the Mercury team should be given the chance to test a man in space for a full day. In addition, all of the Soviet single-seat Vostok spacecraft launched after Vostok 1 lasted for more than a day. Thus, the Mercury 9 flight would bring Mercury spacecraft up to the same level as that of the Soviets. In September 1962, NASA concluded negotiations with McDonald to modify four Mercury spacecrafts, number 12, 15, 17, and 20, to a configuration that supported a one-day mission. Such changes to the spacecraft included the removal of the periscope, a redundant set of thrusters, and the addition of extra batteries and oxygen tanks. In November 1962, Gordon Cooper was chosen to pilot the MA-9 mission, and Alan Shepard was picked as the backup. On April 22, 1963, the Atlas Booster 130D and the Mercury spacecraft number 20 were stacked on the launch pad at Complex 14. Because MA-9 would orbit over nearly every part of the world from 32.5 degrees north to 32.5 degrees south, a total of 28 ships, 171 aircraft, and 18,000 servicemen were assigned to support the mission. The Atlas booster used for the MA-9 supported several technical improvements, most notably the enhanced propulsion system with a hydraulic igniter that would eliminate the need for hold down time at launch to prevent rough combustion. With seven successful Mercury launches in a row, the failure of these early days seemed like a distant memory by early 1963 and NASA officials had a high degree of confidence in the Atlas that overshadowed its still spotty launch record. At the first meeting of the senior MSFC officers for the year, Walter Williams noted that the Air Force had yet to provide an explanation for two Atlas F failures during the second half of 1962, until the investigation committees released their findings that cleared the Atlas D of guilt by association. Cooper's flight would be delayed. During the seven months between Sharia and Cooper's flights, there were five failures of Atlas D vehicles. One of them, an Atlas Aja, the rest operational ICBM tests. NASA did not let its guard down on the Atlas, despite the recent high degree of success enjoyed by Project Mercury. When Atlas 130D received its factory rollout on January 30th, it was found to have damaged wiring and had to be sent back for repairs. At his first press conference on February 8th, Gordon Cooper admitted to not knowing much about the booster problem and focused instead on the enhancements made to his Mercury capsule. The numerous added equipment and consumables for the day-long mission boosted the weight of Faith 7th considerably. It now weighed over 3,000 pounds. On March 15th, the Atlas was rolled out of factory a second time and passed tests with flying colors. Conveyor engineers expressed confidence that this was their best bird yet. Aside from the new propulsion system, the boosters received some slight modifications to the engine offsets to counteract the potentially dangerous roll that occurred during Sharia's launch. The booster also supported an improved calibration of the propellant utilization system. 
the upgraded MA2 engines featured a baffled injector heads and a hypergolic igniter, eliminating any concerns of rough combustion or the need to hold down the time prior to liftoff. As such, the RCC sensors on the 130D were operated open loop and for qualitative purposes only. Cooper's decision to name the capsule Faith 7 was based on the faith that he had in the Atlas booster and the Mercury capsule to carry out the mission successfully. When Cooper boarded Faith 7 at 6.36 a.m. on the morning of May 14th, he found a little gift had been left for him. Alan Shepard, knowing that Cooper would have a new version of the urine containment device that Shepard did not have on his Mercury Redstone 3 flight, had left behind a toilet plunger as a joke. Instructions on the handle read, Remove before launch. The gift did not make the trip. Neither did Cooper that day. Various problems with radar in Bermuda and the diesel engine that rolled back the gantry caused the launch to be canceled until May 15th. At 8.04 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, May 15th, 1963, Faith 7 was launched from the Launch Complex 14. At T plus 60 seconds, the Atlas started its pitch program. Shortly afterwards, MA-9 passed through the Max Q. At T plus 2 minutes 14 seconds, Cooper felt the booster engine cutoff and staging. The two Atlas booster engines had been left behind. The launch escape tower was then jettisoned. At T plus 3 minutes, the cabin pressure sealed at 5.5 PSI. Cooper reported, Faith 7 is all go. At T plus 5 minutes was sustainer engine cutoff, and Faith 7 entered orbit at 17,547 miles per hour. After the spacecraft separated and turned around to orbital altitude, Cooper watched his Atlas boosters lag behind and tumble for about 8 minutes. Over Zanzibar on the first orbit, he learned that the orbital parameters were good enough for at least 20 orbits. Atlas performance was overall excellent. The upgraded propulsion system worked well, with slightly above nominal booster engine thrust. Measurable propellant slosh occurred from T plus 55 to T plus 120 seconds, caused by slightly lower than normal autopilot gains. The flight trajectory was slightly more lofted than normal due to the DC voltage in the booster electrical systems being about 0.7 volts above normal. This was counteracted by the higher than normal booster engine performance. At the start of the third orbit, Cooper checked his list of 11 experiments that were on his schedule. His first task was to eject a 6 inch diameter sphere equipped with Xeon strobe lights from the nose of the spacecraft. This experiment was designed to test his ability to spot and track a flashing beacon in space. At T plus 3 hours and 25 minutes, Cooper flipped the switch on and felt the beacon detach from the spacecraft. He tried to see the flashing light in the approaching dusk on the night side pass but failed to do so. On the fourth, o on the fourth orbit, he did spot the beacon and saw it pulsing. Cooper reported to Scott Carpenter on Kauai, I was a little rascal all night. He also spotted the beacon on his fifth and sixth orbits. Also on his sixth orbit, at about T plus nine hours, Cooper set up cameras, adjusted the spacecraft altitude, and set switches to deploy a tethered balloon from the nose of the spacecraft. It was a 30 inch PET film balloon painted fluorescent orange inflated with nitrogen and attached to a 100 feet nylon line from the antenna canister. A strain gauge in the antenna canister would measure the difference in atmospheric drag between the 100 miles pedigree and the 160 mile apogee. Cooper tried several times to eject the balloon but it failed to eject. Cooper passed Soraya's orbital record on the seventh orbit while he was engaged in radiation experiments. After 10 hours, the Zanzibar tracking station informed Cooper that the flight was a go for 17 orbits. Cooper was orbiting the Earth every 88 minutes, 45 seconds, at an inclination of 32.55 degrees to the equator. 
His scheduled rest period was during orbits 9 through 13. He had dinner of powdered roast beef mush and some water, took pictures of Asia, and reported the spacecraft condition. Cooper was not sleepy and during orbit 9 took some of the best photos made during his flight. He took photos of the Tibetan highlands and of the Himalayans. During the flight, Cooper reported that he could see roads, rivers, small villages, and even individual houses if the lightings and background conditions were right. This was confirmed by the two-man Gemini crews later. Cooper slept intermediately the next six hours during orbits 10 through 13. He woke from time to time, took more pictures, taped status reports, and kept adjusting his spacesuit temperature control, which kept getting too hot or too cold. On his 14th orbit, Cooper took an assessment of the spacecraft condition. The oxygen supply was sufficient. The peroxide fuel for altitude control was at 69% in the automatic tank and 95% in the manual one. On the 15th orbit, he spent most of his time calibrating equipment and synchronizing clocks. When he entered the night on the 16th orbit, Cooper pitched the spacecraft to slowly follow the plane of the elliptic. Through the spacecraft window, he viewed the zodacula light and night airglow layer. He took photos of these two dim light phenomena across the Earth's night side to Canton Island. The pictures were later found to have been overexposed, but they still contained valuable data. At the start of the 17th orbit, while crossing Cape Canaveral, Florida, Cooper transmitted slow scan black and white television pictures to Mercury Control. The pictures showed a ghostly image of the astronaut in the Mercury picture. A helmet and hoses could be seen. It was the first time an American astronaut sent back television images from space. On the 17th and 18th orbits, Cooper took infrared weather photos and moonset Earth limb pictures. He also resumed Geiger counter measures of radiation. He sang during orbits 18 and 19 and marveled at the greenery of Earth. It was nearing 30 hours since liftoff. On the 19th orbit, the first sign of trouble appeared when the spacecraft 0.05G light came on. However, this turned out to be a faulty indicator and the spacecraft was not re-entering. On the 20th orbit, Cooper lost all altitude readings. On the 21st orbit, saw a short circuit occur in the bus bar serving the 250 volt main inverter. This left the automatic stabilization and control system without electric power. On the 21st orbit, John Glenn on board the tracking ship Coastal Sentry Quebec near Japan helped Cooper prepare a revised checklist for retrofire. Due to the system malfunctions, many of the steps would have to be done manually. Only Hawaii and Zanzibar were in radio range on his last orbit, but communications were good. Cooper noted that the carbon dioxide level was rising in the cabin and in his spacesuit. He told Carpenter as he passed over Zanzibar, things are beginning to stack up a little. Throughout the problems, Cooper remained cool, calm, and collected. Cooper did not experience much of an appetite during the flight and ate only because it was scheduled. The food containers and water dispenser systems proved unwieldy and he was not able to properly prepare freeze-dried food packages. So he limited his consumption to cubed food and bite-sized sandwiches. Cooper found the cubed food largely unpalatable, which contributed to his lack of eating. He had no difficulty urinating during the flight, and the urine collection system worked well. Although, transferring urine to storage bags in the cramped capsule proved difficult. Cooper took several naps during the flight, lasting about an hour each. He experienced some discomfort from the pressure suit compressing his knees, which he elevated by moving his feet slightly upward. An hour and 20 minutes before retrofire, Cooper took a dextroamphetamine tablet to ensure his alertness. He reported not feeling any sleepiness for the remainder of the flight. At the end of the 21st orbit, Cooper again contacted Glenn on the coastal sentry Quebec. He reported that the spacecraft was in retro altitude and holding manually. The checklist was complete. 
Glenn gave a 10 second countdown to retro fire. Cooper kept the spacecraft aligned at a 34 degree pitch angle that manually fired the retro rockets on mark. Cooper had drawn lines on the window to stay aligned with constellations as he flew the craft. He later said that he used his wrist watch to time the burn and his eyes to maintain altitude. Fifteen minutes later, Faith 7 landed just four miles from the prime recovery ship, the carrier USS Kursarge. This was the most accurate landing to date, despite the lack of automatic controls. Faith 7 landed seven nautical miles southeast of Midway Island in the Pacific Ocean. Splashdown was at 34 hours 19 minutes 49 seconds after liftoff. The spacecraft tipped over in the water momentarily, then righted itself. Helicopters dropped rescue swimmers and relayed Cooper's request of an Air Force officer for permission to be hoisted aboard the Navy carrier. Permission was granted. 40 minutes later, the explosive hatch blew open on the deck of the Kursarge. Cooper stepped out of Faith 7 to a warm greeting. Post-flight medical examinations of Cooper found that he was slightly dehydrated and experienced a degree of orthostatic hypertension from being seated in the capsule for an entire day. But other than that, no significant effects from the flight were noticed. After the MA-9 mission, there was another debate about whether to fly one more Mercury flight, Mercury Atlas 10. It was proposed as a three-day, 48-hour mission to be flown by Alan Shepard in October 1963. In the end, NASA officials decided it was time to move on to Project Gemini, and the MA-10 never flew. The Mercury program had fulfilled all of its goals. The Faith 7 spacecraft is currently on display at the Space Center Houston, Houston, Texas. Thank you for watching the Mercury Project. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you already have, thank you. Have a nice day.